Hey there, this is Raymond, and this is part 9 of my introduction to programming with Rust series. Today we're going to be talking about lifetimes. So what is a lifetime? Lifetimes have to do with borrows or references in Rust. If you remember back on day 7, we had functions that would borrow values instead of owning them. So temporarily accessing values owned by something else, indicated by these ampersand signs. Now, a lot of languages have this concept, but one thing that Rust has in particular is the notion of tracking the scope or the lifetimes of these references to make sure that they're always valid. Up until now, we haven't had to do anything special. Rust is taking care of this for us. The lifetimes of these references are being tracked by the Rust compiler, and we don't have to do anything special about it. But today we're going to cover a case where we have to explicitly annotate these lifetimes or mark them in a certain way to let Rust know what we're doing. So let's get started. I'm going to make a new program and to start with we're going to have some nums some numbers which we'll make out of a vector one two three now as i covered previously there's a really easy way we can enumerate all of the numbers in that vector so for example to print them out we would make a for loop and just say for n in nums print n run that really quick showing that we print those numbers out but let's go into a little bit more detail about what for loop actually means. If we were to desugar or break this syntax out into what it expands to internally when Rust compiles it, it would actually be creating a new scope like this and then actually making a new value temporarily, which is mutable, called the iterator. And then instead of saying for n in nums, it would be while let sum n equal iter next. So apart from the warning that we get saying that we could have written this as a for loop because it's easier to express, the function does perform the same work. Now let's explain what this is. Essentially, an iterator is a new kind of object which temporarily borrows a collection like a vector and allows you to call a function next on it over and over again to walk through that collection. Now as you can see in the type inlay hints, what the next function of the iterator gives us is a borrow or a reference to one of the things in the collection. Now that's pretty neat, but what if we wanted to make our own iterator to do something more than just borrow the elements of the collection one at a time? Well, this is how you would do it. Struct our iterator. And because the iterator is going to be borrowing that collection, we would have to store a borrow of the collection in the iterator. So we would do something like this. Now, an iterator also has to remember where in the sequence it is because every time we call next on it, it's going to return the next one after the one we returned previously. So here we'll just keep it simple and make it an i, which is the u size. And then let's make our iterator special. We'll have some kind of multiplication factor. So unfortunately, we already ran into a problem. If we hover over, we say missing lifetime specifier, considering introduced a named lifetime parameter. What the heck is that? So this is our first example where we run into, we have to explicitly annotate a lifetime. So the way we do this is we mark in between the ampersand and the rest of the type, a single quote, and then some word, typically A is used as a placeholder if you don't have anything better, or we could call this nums if we wanted. I'll just keep it simple and call it A. There's also like the autocomplete is kind of showing us there is a special annotation called static, which means that the lifetime is for the entire duration of the program, which I'm sure we'll cover in the future. But let's keep it simple now, A. We save that, we're going to have another problem saying that it's undeclared. The way you declare a lifetime is similar to how you declare generic in angle brackets after the name of our type. That's good, so we can continue now to the next step. Let's implement iterator for our iterator. Implement missing members fills in a lot of the stuff for us. Now, a couple problems here. For one, it's going to tell us the implicit elided lifetime not allowed here. Fancy talk for saying that we have to provide a value for the lifetime annotation we declared up here. So one way we could do it is to just copy paste to there. And because it's undeclared also there, the way you declare it in an impl block is to put it next to the impl. So to solve this other problem, I need to introduce what is an associated type, as the error message says the associated type in impl without a body, declare, declare an implementation. Now we've gone over generics before. They're often used to fill in a type at the very end when we're implementing something. But in the meantime, when we're specifying the interface, to just kind of leave it generic. An associated type is similar to that. 
The exception is that an associated type is where we would have a single type, whereas a generic can expand to multiple types, which makes sense here. When we iterate our numbers, we expect there to be only one kind of item, which is the type I32 in this case. So we just fill that in there. So as I've kind of shown and hinted at before, the iterator all revolves around a single function called next. It returns an optional item. The self item refers to this item type here, which is going to be I32. If we wanted to, we could put I32 here, and that works too. But I'm just going to keep it self item. That way, if we wanted to change the type of the item, we could do it any time in just one place here. Now, it's option because when you get to the end of the collection, you're supposed to return none. If you're not at the end, you would return sum, and then inside of that sum would be the next item. So using our numbers and our index, we would do something like this. Check first if the index is within the size of our vector. Now, if it's not, we're going to return none. However, for R, we're going to return some value, so self.nums i. But we have to remember to advance the iterator too. So first, let's take out this and bind it to some value. Then increment i, and then return that some value. And let me close this to get that out of the way. Now I have to put self here as well. Now that's great, but we haven't used our x yet. So to make it a little bit interesting, let's take our value and multiply it by self x. So that instead of getting 1, 2, 3, we'll get 1, 2, 3 times x. So let's add a function that we can use to construct one of our iterators. So implement over some lifetime a, our iterator a. And this is fairly standard. You have some function new. And we're going to fill in basically the state of our iterator. So we have to have our numbers. And here's where, we're, again, we're going to use that lifetime a. And then put introduce our x. And we're going to produce our self, which is our iterator. Self, just nums. I is going to start at 0 and our x. And then down at the bottom here, we're actually using, instead of using iter, here's where we're going to call our new function. So our iterator new nums. And let's put in a 2. And remember to borrow the nums. Now running this, we'll see that indeed it's using our iterator now. So instead of 1, 2, 3, it's 2, 4, 6. Now, as an aside, let's cover the warning that we get here in our new function. It's going to tell us that writing a borrow for vec instead of borrow of a slice, that's what that means, involves one more reference. So it's basically telling us it's more efficient to get a slice of the contents of the vector rather than to get a reference to the vector itself. So we haven't used this much, but essentially this syntax says that we are not borrowing the entire vector, so we're not going to get access to the vector's methods, we just want to get to the data inside the vector. You can think of it as a view into the list of items inside the vector. So we're going to do the same thing up here. It really doesn't change our code that much because we can still call the length of a slice and we can still index a slice. But it does get rid of that extra warning. Now this warning has to do with the fact that we could have written a for loop. So let's just silence that over our main because we're intentionally desugaring the syntax to explain a few things. Okay, now that we have a custom iterator, I'm going to move on to explain one of the more tricky things in Rust, which is the concept of a borrow checker. Here I have duplicated our iterator, and I can put in a different number for x here, for example, and run this to show you that this will print out two lists, 246 and 369. Now, in this case, it's unnecessary to have these extra scopes. Let's just get rid of these scopes here. I do need to make these two named differently, so let's call this nums2 and call this one nums3. And let me create both iterators first without using either to show you how we can borrow from numbers more than once as long as we're only borrowing it immutably, as in we're not going to be changing those numbers. And this still works. But what happens if we try to change the numbers before we use the iterator? So let's maybe in here we'll say like nums push in a 4. And to do this, we'll need to mark our numbers as mutable. And the moment we try to do that, we'll say we can't borrow nums as mutable because it's also borrowed as immutable. This is the classic borrow checker error. Now to explain what's going on, I have to show you the definition of push where it says that we're borrowing self mutably. 
Indeed, we have to because we're going to be changing the vector to push 4 onto the end of it. Now, we can do this before we do the construction of the iterators because at this point, we haven't borrowed nums. The moment we borrow nums, we're not going to be able to modify the vector until those iterators are no longer in use. So they've gone out of scope. So we could push it down here. Now you might say, well, nums2 and nums3 don't, still exist, right? Technically, they don't anymore because at this point, they can't exist. So why is it here that we don't have a compiler error? Aren't we adding 4 to the list while still borrowing nums inside of these two iterators? Well, it turns out Rust is smart enough to do something similar to this in this case, where it creates an extra scope. So you can think of it as these iterators cease to exist at this point, and then our immutable borrows go away, and we're able to borrow nums mutably again. Now, if you actually want to get some insight into the actual scopes of variables, there's one thing you can do, which is to use the drop trait. So in addition to iterator, let's implement the drop trait for our iterator. And I'll do control dot implement missing members. And we'll just have it print out something like print destroying our iterator for x and just to print out self dot x there. And let's have it print out pushing four into our vector here just to illustrate. And then I'll run this. We can see it printed out 2, 4, 6, 3, 6, 9, then destroyed our two iterators, then pushed 4 into our vector. Interesting side note, if I at this point remove this extra scope, Rust is going to have a problem because it doesn't think that those borrows for the iterator actually went away. I believe that has to do with our implementing the drop trait ourselves. So what we can do is either put that scope back in like this, or alternatively, another thing you can do is when we're done with these iterators, we can simply drop them like this. That does change the order in which they get dropped. Now, since we dropped iterator at x2 early, we see it's actually destroyed before the iterator 3 is actually used. So it gives you some control about when values are actually dropped. Most of the time, Rust will automatically drop variables when they go out of scope. And sometimes they'll do things a little bit unexpectedly where they'll drop them a little bit early. In this case, it's not because we're implementing the drop trait ourselves. But anyway, if you want it to be explicit, implement the drop trait and drop them yourself. Now, one little thing we can improve upon this is to introduce the concept of the anonymous lifetime. So for example, in the drop trait, we never actually needed to use this annotated lifetime. So one might be tempted to just delete them. Problem is the compiler is going to tell us that it expected some lifetime and it found some static lifetime and implicitly a, a light lifetime is not allowed here, assuming a static lifetime. And then they give us a hint, indicate the anonymous lifetime. So that's a special annotation where we use the underscore. We've seen underscore in the past in Rust. It usually stands for when something needs to be there, but we don't need a name for it, or we're just telling the compiler to figure out the value or the type. In this case, it works with the lifetimes. It's saying that our iterator type needs to be marked with a lifetime, but we're not actually going to use the lifetime in this implementation. So just put something in there to make it work. Now, we can't do that for our implementation of new, because if we tried to, and even if we put the implicit lifetime, it's going to have a problem because it's going to get confused about lifetimes here. It's going to say, well, the, the anonymous lifetime is for the lifetime of the new call. But wait a minute, there's this other reference here for nums. So in that case, we do have to be explicit and say that the, um, the A lifetime is the one that matters. Basically, the input nums is going directly into our self and stored there so it has to all match up now for iterator we also don't need just like for the drop we could just leave that out and put the anonymous lifetime there as well so you'll see this in a few other places in rust where something needs to have a lifetime annotation but it's not actually used you can substitute it with the anonymous lifetime now why is it that we have to put a lifetime annotation here at all it's just a rule in rust that if you have a type like this our iterator where there is something borrowed inside of it that in order to express that a borrow is carried into that type that it requires a lifetime annotation so i know we covered an awful lot in this video but hopefully by now you understand a little bit more about lifetimes and borrows we've explored the iterator trait and the drop trait we've introduced associated types and there's a lot more we could talk about lifetimes and borrow checking it's one of the really hard concepts in rust 
to learn, but I'm just going to try to keep it simple for this video and give you a taste of it. We're going to end up bumping into that brow checker a lot, but with these fundamentals in place, hopefully it's a bit easier for you to learn it. In the next video, we're going to talk about closures or anonymous functions. So I hope you'll stick with this series. Thank you for watching. See you next time.